building product manufacturing companies, very smart at making things, at distributing materials, not the best at marketing and very old school in the sales uh, department. Today, we've got John Crosby, who is a VP of sales, and we'll get into your company and everything. But John, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Matt, I really appreciate the invitation. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I guess for the people at home here, maybe you could just give us like, what's the one lighter? What's the elevator pitch? You're a sales guy. So I bet you've got that buttoned up. What do you, what do you, what does your company do? I, ironically, uh, my career has not been marked with sales leadership. It okay. just happens to be in this current role. But I, I think that actually is an advantage for me. Um, in my current role, I, I lead uh, sales for Sandow Design Group, which includes uh, two media properties, Interior Design, the Interior Design brand, and Metropolis, uh, which uh, basically focus on the architecture and interiors uh, space and uh, lead a team that's internationally focused. Um, I have about 15 years in designing construction media and associations uh, and uh, delivering for, in particular, companies in the building products and material space. Awesome. Well, we're going to talk about breaking down those silos between sales and marketing, right? When you think about this term of sales enablement, that's something we were talking about. Like That means a lot of different things, a lot of different people. But maybe you can give us kind of the, the headline there. Why is this important? I, I think there's a distinction in how people use the phrase sales enablement. I, I think a lot of people in sales in particular or executives uh, use the, the phrase sales enablement as meaning enabling sales. I personally think, and I, I think there are a lot of people who share this view, that, that sales enablement is about enabling sales people. Mm -hmm. and unleashing okay. the potential for them to do great things for the company and for their clients or customers. So to me, there's a, the human element kind of gets right. lost because of the technological evolution of sales and marketing and, and moving into really powerful CRM environments kind of ch has changed the game a little bit. And I, and I think to the detriment of actually creating a mechanism for stronger, tighter sales and marketing alignment. Why is this important now? Or what are you seeing that's like, hey, we need to fix this? Yeah. So it starts with um, the epiphany I had uh, several years back working for a design and construction, another design and construction media organization, um, where I realized that, uh, well, first of all, the organization had a very weak marketing entity in general and was providing zero customer focused marketing. Okay. Um, and as a result, was not even plugged into the CRM, not doing anything to provide support to sales. And so when we started to build an effective marketing organization, the first principle from the sales leadership was we need to be aligned. We cannot interrupt sales. We need to actually energize sales. We need to do that through all marketing activities, but we also need to do it by preparing and and. Uh, training the sales team to be effective communicators on behalf of the company and advocates for their their clients. So that the epiphany I had at that point was, wait a minute, we're out there telling companies you need to do a better job of marketing to uh, our audience, and therefore you can become more effective in sales. And we weren't even eating our own dog food. Mm. So the, the epiphany I had at that point was, wait a minute. How many companies out there are professing something to their clients and not even living it themselves? Right. So um, fast forward a few years and I actually moved, uh, I've, I've spent most of my career in, in associations and it's actually meaningfully changed how I view marketing and sales. Um, mm. Longer story, but uh, I moved back into the association realm and my mandate with that organization was to strengthen ties with the supplier community that uh, really targeted our membership. Um, and I noticed that the companies in that space, and we're talking about building product manufacturing companies, very smart at making things, at distributing materials, not the best at marketing, and very old school in the sales uh, department. So uh, when we started trying to figure out how we could create a tighter relationship with our members, uh, the first thing our members told us was, well, 
we have an issue right up front because sales teams with a lot of these companies just don't understand how to build relationships with us. Mm. Okay. Problem, for, probably the first problem that marketing can solve with a sales team is understanding the market, developing personas that can be activated right. with the sales team, and then helping them to use words and phrases and, and tactics that will actually resonate with the audience. So to me, um, the, the notion of enablement is, is maybe the first thing that any marketer should consider when trying to align more tightly with the sales team. But you have this like powerful entity that's just not being fully realized uh, in a lot of cases, right? And you're like, well, well, let's go do this other thing, this ad campaign or this whatever. And it almost feels like you're two different companies in, 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 in many ways. I, I'll tell you, I have a daughter who just uh, graduated with a business degree in marketing, and she's actually working for a Fortune 500 company uh, in not their marketing department, but actually their uh, sales operations department. Mm -hmm. And the first thing she told me after about a couple of weeks on the job is marketing education doesn't prepare me for this. So right. I think one of the fundamentals is coming out of uh, any university environment, you understand marketing. That's great. Yeah. But if a company expects you to be supportive of sales and understanding how to activate sales, that's probably a gap for a lot of young marketing professionals in understanding how to support the sales team. That's right, right. the first comment I have on that. Yeah. The second part is, let's face it, there's a lot of work to be done in marketing and there's a lot of subjectivity to it. We know this, sales teams judge marketing campaigns all the time, whether it's you know graphic design or whether it's the message or what have you, um, everybody thinks they know marketing. But so I think there's been a level of protectionism around a lot of the activities and campaigns that marketing drives. Um, so psychologically, I can understand that there's historically been that walling off. Yeah, the for truth sure. is marketers need to listen more to salespeople to validate the research they're generating right. and and the, the results they're getting from their campaigns because sometimes they don't match up and you need to figure out why. You know, are you finding that in, in these organizations it starts with that that culture and, and sort of changing it, shifting mindsets? How do you kind of reach the hearts and minds? How do you market to the marketers? My experience shows that it really requires a change in marketing leadership. Yeah. Um, my interactions with mid-level managers and, and marketing directors, um, you know, they've got, They've got to report to, you know, senior leadership and uh, there are expectations about results and changing marketing strategies or changing processes or how you work with sales. If if leadership isn't bought in, it's going to be a tough slog. Yeah, and every sure. company I've worked with where we've witnessed a change in marketing leadership and, and in some of the roles I've had, they've actually clients have actually come to us and asked for advice on the audience and on how best to approach that audience and new marketing leaders who ask those questions. It's really easy to convey to them. You've got to find a way to align more closely yeah. to your sales team if they haven't already figured that out for themselves. So um, I, I think it does require a change in leadership yeah. more often than not. Well, I want to go deeper in how we're, how some of the ways that you've found success in breaking down those silos between marketing and sales. But mm -hmm. I would love to for everybody listening to just understand quickly what does a Sandow do? What are you guys selling? What are you, what's the value you're bringing? Help me understand that environment a little bit more. Absolutely. So um, Sandow addresses the architecture and design community, and that uh, broadly represents. Uh, professionals who are designing buildings, yeah, but also design professionals who may be just involved in one aspect of that building. It could be the interiors, or it could be the engineering elements of the of the structure. But writ large, addressing the A and D community, as we call it, right. through content, through data, through meaningful support and engagement with that community. Um, and we bring them together with companies in particular in the building materials and furnishings um, uh, space uh, in, in order to help prepare them to design a better building. So maybe you could give us a little peek. What are some of the things that are working for you that you've you know come to understand can be successful? Well, 
one thing that we're doing and I, I am fully supportive of because I actually have done this in, in prior roles uh, is base everything that we're going to do on behalf of a client on research and insights from the, the audience we serve. Mm, okay. So if we start with that, there's a lot that we can do, whether it's training or producing content around events, generating online forums, um, research. You know, we've got a whole arm at, at Sandow that focuses on, on research called Think mm. Lab. Getting them to the point where they can see that there are opportunities where their value proposition can connect with our audience, but where I see enablement coming into play is next. If we're doing all these things for them, one of the things that we can do with the data we've collected, with the experience we have in our own marketing efforts on behalf of clients, is we can teach them to fish. Hmm. Um, what, we have a plenty of information around analytics on our own platforms, around our events, knowing what works and doesn't work. Teaching um, the sales teams. Teaching the sales fish. teams how to engage with our audience in the best possible way yeah. because we've learned um, and we've acquired data and information that supports what we have learned. So um, a very good example, especially within this community, is that um, you know research has shown the designer really does want a strategic relationship with a sales rep from an, an OEM, uh, building product manufacturer, mm, not yeah. a distributor. And so uh, the, the message that we convey to sales reps on teams within these companies is don't just go in trying to sell a product. Go in and have a conversation with someone about the category. Understand the category. Take right. some time before you ever walk into a, a design office and learn what drawings look like. Try to interpret them. If you can understand those drawings, then sitting down and having that conversation can immediately pivot to a project that they're working on. That Those two things alone establish a, a rep as being someone of strategic value to a design professional. Right. And, and this obviously can be applied in just about any profession. If you understand what kind of pain points exist for that professional, um, you know, you, you know, you can obviously have a pathway for preparing to have that conversation and being a resource that isn't about closing the sale. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One thing that we've learned from our clients, they tell us when our reps go in and act as category experts, um, they can be honest with a trusted client and say, look, I'll tell you if our product is a good fit for this project um, or if it's not. Yeah. And and that immediately crosses a threshold into I understand that this person is actually going to help me solve a problem right. as opposed to sell a product. You and I talked before and, and you mentioned this other concept, too, that I kind of wanted to dive into a little bit, which was treating your B2B prospects like influencers in order to win deals. So I'd love to, to talk about that. What does that mean to treat yeah. your B2B prospects like influencers? So if if, if you consider for a moment that the B2B uh, purchasing decision today, very different from, I'd say, 20 years ago. And, and certainly, I would think to, to some degree different than even 10 years ago or five years ago, but maybe depending on the, the industry. Um, bottom line is there are many decision makers or influencers in a, a significant B2B buying decision. Yeah, uh, we're not talking about buying pencils. We're talking about buying technology or buying consulting services or buying marketing programs or uh, or marketing services. These things cost a lot of money. And usually a, a, an executive wants their team to be involved in helping to make the decision about what's what's the right choice for the company. And it's not always about the, the price, although price, I'm sure is one or two on the, sure. on the list of, of choices or priorities. So um, in a B2B buying environment, when so many people are involved, at, at minimum, you have to consider if it's a mid-sized company, there's probably two to three, if not more people involved. And you, as a, a, a sales or marketing leader um, for someone selling into that organization, you have to consider for a moment, uh, do you know who the final decision maker is? Do you know who's doing research in order to validate whatever decision is being made? Do you know who's had experience with one 
you know, competitor or with your product in the past. If, if you don't have that information, right. you have to address the entirety of the buying team. One of the things I'm seeing in some of the larger organizations that have large sales organizations, they have a, a decent marketing department. Um, some of them reorganizing to be, basically be the customer experience team, so to speak. And it's not really marketing and sales, even at the organizational level. Is that something yep. that you're seeing at all in your world or any thoughts on that? Well, actually, uh, this year we've launched, we actually relaunched all of our services to the, the building products and materials industry as, um, as a new experience for our clients. It's, it's actually called SDG Max. Okay. So as opposed to our, our, our business selling uh, episodically advertising or marketing campaigns or event sponsorships or what have you, we are now offering uh, subscription-based programs that annualize the investment for our clients. And in the process, what we are doing is transforming the customer experience for, uh, for the client. Mm. Um, that includes uh, easing the path for payment processing. We, we're actually amortizing payments as opposed to requiring them to pay lump sums at various points during mm. the year. We're giving them white glove service through media planning services. So we're trying to create this community for our, our clients in a way that's actually making us more magnetic to them than simply just buying advertising from us. Right. Um, yeah, I, customer experience is huge. I will tell you from, from a selling standpoint, it's, it's been a bit of a transition for us. Change is hard, man. For you got that right. <laughs> yeah. I wish it was easy. <laughs> if it was, there'd be everybody be doing it, you know. Well, it, it, this is the part of a change management is a I mean, in the largest companies there are whole teams that are focused on yeah. change management, and in an organization as nimble as we are, that doesn't happen. It's you know, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Right. So, um, <laughs> right. you got to stay alive and, yeah. and keep the lights on. Yep, that makes sense. Um, well, I want to ask you a question that I like to ask all my guests, which is a little bit of a departure from the topic here, but mm -hmm. what is one word or phrase? I'll give you a minute to think if you need it. What's one word or phrase that we should no longer use in the workplace? What comes to mind? I don't care what kind of business you're in or what kind of organization you're in. If you say we're not in the digital content business, you are behind. So even just say, just the fact that we even have to talk about it. At every content. business in every sector of the economy is in the digital content business. Yeah. Whether they like it or not. So if you're, if you are in business, you better be producing digital content to engage with your customers. Your I came up with this on the fly, sitting at a, a corporate meeting uh, with a very large multinational corporation, uh, talking to their CEO and uh, he was beating me up about, you know, perceived value in this, that, or the other that they were purchasing from us. And I asked him about his website and he said, oh, we've got a great website. And I said, I searched your website and it took me about 15 clicks to get to the point of finding a product guide about your flagship product. And I said, if it takes me that long to find that, I don't think you have an understanding of the journey that your buyer has to take in order to find information about your product. And he said, well, you know, we're not experts at content. And I, and that's when I said it to him, if you don't think you're in the digital content business, you are already behind. Wow. Well, did he, did he change his tune or did he like, screw you? I'm so, out of here. <laughs> so this was, a, being this, irrelevant. this was a project. Uh, when I was with the American Institute of Architects, we engaged this company in actually conducting uh, market research on the evolution of their website mm -hmm. and help them simplify that website to make it cleaner and more usable for design professionals. Um, but we also advocated for them to provide more third-party verification information on their website about their products and materials because it fostered a, a deeper sense of trust. If third parties are validating what they're claiming about their own products, then uh, a design professional in particular will trust that that product could be used on a project. Um, so there were multiple layers to this, but ultimately all of it was about producing content that helped to lower the barrier to a purchasing decision. Yes, we're talking about 
bringing the B to the sales organization, the marketing organization together, that's kind of underneath it. But all of these things we're talking about is really, you know, how do you break through to B2B prospects and clients today? We know it's understanding how we operate as an organization. We know that it's understanding our client, but I feel like that's where we kind of landed here. I, I think B2B buying is, you know, it, it's, it's also converging a little bit more with the B2C experience. Right. I mean, Absolutely. social media is a perfect example of how it, it, it was B2C from the start and B2B is now figuring out ways to utilize it the right way. I, I think it's more personal. Um, I think relationships still matter. I don't think in, in complex businesses, I don't think you can simply say um, that a digital engagement is going to get a, a win uh, on converting someone into a sale. I think you have to have a relationship at some level, 100%. Um, even if it's just a brand relationship. Yeah. Well, I think what we're finding is there's just so many nuances, like we're in the digital content business but it, this business has been around for a while, has evolved, and it's compli it's complicated and it's nuanced. Now we're in this world where, like, there's so much terrible content, so much you know AI generated content. If you just, I th I can't remember what the ratio is to AI generated written content to actual human content, um, but it's it's authenticity and understanding your customer and speaking their language is going to be more scarce than ever. So understanding and working with experts who, who can navigate you through that, net, that digital com, content world is going to be more important than ever. I, good. Authenticity rules, and especially um, the, the higher the price point for, for the investment, the, the, the more important the authenticity becomes. Um, and AI is not there yet in terms of being able to convey complex messages and themes in a way that's going to convert a, a big ticket sale. But we're not there yet. Yeah. But I do think that to your point, B2B and really more sophisticated B2B companies are figuring out how to match that relationship building daily conversation part of sales and marketing with digital content that number one could help build brand awareness is at the top of the funnel, but also could be a little bit more um, middle of the funnel, like, you know, positioning your, your people as the experts or thought leaders or top of mind people. And if you can do those things together simultaneously, you can really, really stand out. Um, I no question about that. When you're dealing with a B2B sales rep, I, I, I think it's incumbent upon them to tap into the thought leadership and the expertise within the company. Um, I, I, you are probably sitting in a great position where if, if, folks in your organization are attempting to sell to a, a client and you've got years of experience uh, in complex marketing strategies and utilizing leading edge content strategies, of course, they're going to want to tap into your brain in order to sell to that, to that client. In, a, in a, an environment like we're in, where there's a lot of science behind the yeah. materials yep. that are being sold, uh, oftentimes the rep can't be a subject matter expert no, can't convey no. a lot of depth and has to rely on an expert in order to convey that information. So again, industry specific can, can change the dynamic on. For sure. Leadership that well. makes sense. And I just think that really it's all to say that there is, there are, the, it's a little bit more complex of a landscape and what you can do and should do with content is just a, a lot more nuanced. There's a lot more opportunities, but the challenge I think is, you start, okay, well, let's make content because we're supposed to make content is the, is like the biggest pitfall. So like what, to your point, well, what's going to work for our industry? What's going to work for our company? And also how do we make sure that we stand out and we're not looking like the same company that, you know, company B is, is doing the exact same thing. We have to also understand how to position ourselves um, in a way that allows us to kind of, you know, display that what makes us different. So no question. Yep. But hey, that's for another topic, another another conversation. John, this is great. Thank you so much. I, it's been great to kind of understand how you're bringing the sales and marketing teams together in, in, in order to break through in, in this world of B2B. Um, and you know what? Let's, let's all just understand that we're in the digital content marketing business. I don't think we have to talk about it anymore, right? No question. And, and the sales team can and should be a part of supporting that evolution.
Absolutely. Makes sense. Awesome, John. Well, hey, thank you so much for being a part of the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Matt. Oh, final.